The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, episode 760 for Monday, May 6th, 2019. Ah, Greetings, folks, and... Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take all your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, all the stuff you find, all the stuff we find. We mix it all together. The goal being that every single one of us, that includes us, your hosts, all of us, because we're all in this together. The goal is we all, every one of us, learn at least five new things every week when we get together. Sponsors for this episode include... TextExpander.com slash podcast, Malwarebytes.com slash Mac, Captera.com slash MGG, and a new one that I'm actually really excited to tell you about, Experian.com slash MGG with Experian Boost. I'll give you more details about that in a little bit. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairville, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? Yeah, all right. Good. Hang that's good. That's good. So this is an exciting week here in Mackie land. We, we actually have some housekeeping to go through, but it's it's uh, well, one is a cleanup and one is a new thing. We've added a new addition. There's a new a new room over there. And that new room takes the shape of the Mac Geek Gab weekly newsletter. So this is a little bit meta because we're announcing the newsletter in the episode that will be sent out to the newsletter two weeks ago. I decided we needed to take advantage and and like, you know, be able to be in touch with you people in, uh, you know, in better ways. But I didn't know what to do. And 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 then listener Rob serendipitously suggested and said, hey, wouldn't it be great? Have you guys ever thought about sending out a weekly newsletter that includes all the show notes? Because we don't get to click the links when we're listening to the episode, you know, if we're at the gym or driving or commuting or whatever, and sure, we can go back to MacGeekGab.com, but if you were to send those to us, that would be great. And it was like, oh, the heavens opened up like that's brilliant. Awesome. So we created it and it will go out Monday morning, May 6th. Uh, in fact, it will probably go out before this ep- this episode goes live. Oh, it should not. I should make sure this episode is live before it goes out so that this episode is the one that's in it. OK, I will do that. Uh, so now I got to I got to do a little juggling act, but that's OK, because it's there now. It's being sent to all uh, premium listeners. In fact, if you are a premium listener or were have, have ever been a premium listener earlier uh, late last week, you got an email sort of announcing this list and saying, yes, we know you signed up, but we've never sent you anything. So we certainly understand if you want to unsubscribe, but we hope you don't though. In fact, we hope you subscribe, but this is list is not limited to premium members. It's just, they're the folks that had signed up for the list. So anyone can sign up now. If you go to MacGeekGab.com, we've got little forms there. You just type in your email address. We're currently using MailChimp as our partner for this. So, uh, you know, we'll see how that goes and, and, and it, but it's an evolution like everything here. You know, we listen to what you have to say. We're very excited about this, as you can probably tell. And, uh, and I think it's going to really be a great thing. Cause you've got all the links for all the things you mentioned. You've got the, all the links for the sponsors. Right. And we always say like, it's our job to encourage you to, to get you, um, to go and check the sponsors out from there. It's between you and them. Well, this makes that easier and it makes it easier for you to help us do our job in that regard. And that's gonna, also going to be a good thing, but really it's about getting those show notes and the links and all that stuff to you. So, so very excited about that, but please do feel free to sign up. You do not, there are no, everybody's welcome as always. So just go to MacGeekab.com and, and sign yourself up and, uh, and we will rock this thing together. Uh, anything to add to that, John, before I get into the rest of the housekeeping here? Nope. It's awesome. I'm excited about it. We, we aren't, what's say that again, John, right in your mailbox, right in your mailbox. Yeah. And you know, the cool part is certainly we're going to have this, you know, every week, uh, we'll send out the episode notes. Absolutely. Uh, but we can also use this to, you know, and we're not going to pester you because we trust us. Like you think you get a lot of email. 
I think we probably get at least as much, if not perhaps a lot more. So we do understand inbox clutter. We, we don't want to be a part of that. We want to be valuable. Uh, but mm, we might do some things, you know, uh, occasional like once a month addition to the list on a Thursday or something like that. But we'll we'll it'll evolve. It's a thing. We'll just keep in touch. Let us know what you think. You know, feedback at, at MacKeyCab.com. Did I hear you right, Dave? Did you say feedback at MacKeyCab.com? That is exactly what I said. It is feedback at MacKeyCab.com. Speaking of MacGeekab.com, for a long time, we have published our recording calendar. And this is truly the calendar that John and I use to schedule when we are going to meet and record the show. Uh, but we have made that public. Something ha- as, as, as an iCloud, you know, shared calendar link. Something happened to that at some point in the last few months. I'm not sure when, where you could subscribe and you would get events. But they wouldn't necessarily be the right events because they would be like they were frozen in time as of some date in the past. Uh, Any changes we made, like when we, you know, if we have to adjust the schedule or whatever. No. Uh, So we had to essentially refresh that calendar. Really, what we had to refresh was the public facing link. Now, the link is still available. The new link is available at MacGeekGub.com slash calendar. So if you just go there, that will offer to subscribe you in your calendar of choice and, and you're good to go. Unfortunately, there's no way we could automate this for all of you that were previously subscribed. So you need to remove the MacGeekGub calendar from your calendar of choice and then visit MacGeekGub.com slash calendar to subscribe. Again, everyone's welcome. So if you want to subscribe and then that'll let you know when you can go to uh, MacGeekGub.com slash stream or join hashtag MacGeekGub in IRC.MacGeekGub.com uh, and, and you know, join us and listen to while we listen to the show while we record and, and give feedback, which you've heard about and all that good stuff. So there you go. There's that. Anything to add about that, John, before we get to things here? Nope. Okay. Is there more? Well, there's one last thing, and and that is that on Saturday, May 11th, so this coming Saturday, uh, if you're listening to the episode shortly after it comes out, I am speaking uh, just outside Philadelphia at the Mainline Mug at mlmug.org. Saturday morning, I think I'm speaking, I think the meeting starts at 9 a.m. I think I'm speaking at 10, talking about backups. So if you are in the area, please, please, please come out and say hello. It would be great to see you. And that's what I have to say about that. And now let's go to Neil because Neil has a fun one. Neil says, I am having the frequent USB drive improperly dismounted problem. The machine is an iMac Pro just upgraded to 10.14.4. The odd thing is that there are multiple such notifications, all with a strange icon that is basically a sheet of paper with a large A. At the bottom right hand corner, the notification has a button labeled show, which does nothing when clicked. If I lock my screen and then either enter my un- or then enter my unlock password, the notifications change to the standard finder device improperly dismounted icon. And then I can click the dismiss button. This is happening with two different USB drives, both connected to the same USB three hub connected to a USB three port on the iMac Pro. Interestingly, most of the time, both drives are still present on the desktop and accessible. Uh, Just once I had to reboot to get them to reappear. Disconnecting and reconnecting the hub did not fix the issue in that one scenario. This is not happening with my two Drobos, which are connected via Thunderbolt 3 in a daisy chain configuration. In the past, when I've had these kinds of dismounts, I found they get resolved when the drive is replaced. So I usually assume it's a failure of the drive, but oddly It's happening with two different drives. So I wonder if it's because they're both connected to the same hub. Could that be the issue? Could one drive be failing and messing up the entire USB chain? Um, He says, I thought of disconnecting one drive and seeing if it fixes the problem and swapping and isolating and troubleshooting and honoring the troubleshooting process and all that. Uh, He says, I'm reluctant to start replacing drives until I have a better handle on what's going on. Any thoughts? So I I would, I, 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 in reading this, I would think it's an issue with the hub. Um, if possible, can you connect directly to the iMac and or a different hub just to test? Again, part of that isolation 
thing. Honestly, again, you know, guessing from far more than arm's length away, it sounds like a power issue where the drive or interface is losing power very briefly and then coming back. The computer's noticing the drop, but by the time you're, you know, made aware of this, the drive's already back and everything's good. Uh, so, John, I I would recommend one of your favorite utilities, Hardware Growler, uh, because that will give you far more granular uh information about when and what is happening on the usb bus any any thoughts from you on that <sighs> i had this happen a while ago and as it turned out so i agree with what you said so far but the other thing you may want to check it could be one of your cables i actually had a situation where on one of my machines the drive kept doing that it kept saying you know dismounted or, you know you did you didn't uh you know, get rid of it properly. Sure. And uh, as it turns out, I think it was a flaky cable. Fast. Also, it, it was the form factor that I don't really like. It's like crimped in the middle. You know what I'm talking about? Crimped in the middle USB, of the cable? USB, uh, no, one, one end of the cable, it, it's almost like two sections and it's it's flat. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. What that's called. Huh. Is it one of those universal USB A things where you can go either way? I've seen those. Those always seem a little janky to me where you can, you know, flip it and it still works. Or was it is it the one that's that's custom to USB three over USB A that has like the little extra hop in it or something? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think of the name of it. But. Yep. Anyways, that was, it turns out that, that that was just flaky. I got a different enclosure and then everything was great. So, so it was the cable or the connector on the enclosure? Uh, it was the, one of the connections from the cable into the enclosure. Got it. Um, was intermittent. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair. I, and, you know, the other thing that's worth talking about, I don't think this is Neil's problem, but. It's worth talking about that uh, USB three hard drives. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, John. My caffeine hasn't quite kicked in yet today. Yes, I'm having caffeine. I had a gig last night. Um, is that uh, 2.4 gigahertz devices, right, can interfere with with USB three hard drives? Oh, yeah. Right. OK, so if you've got like it might be a proximity thing, if you've got, you know, a new router or you're using 2.4 gigahertz with your iMac to connect to, you know, your Wi-Fi network or whatever, that could do the problem, have be the problem. Right. Oh, yeah. OK. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, you know, think about that. All right. Yeah. So relocate them. That's, yes. Yeah. That's general or, or, or yeah, speed drop it down to USB two, but that you probably don't want to do. So, and, and, and sometimes you can't. So, all right. Going to Phil who says a few years ago, I moved my airport extreme 2011 to my office, setting up a personal Wi-Fi network on my end of the building. It's been working well, and I connect my mid-2010 MacBook Pro and my 2018 Air without a problem. Also, the MacBook Pro via Ethernet cable into that works. He says, but I usually just use the Wi-Fi connection. Okay. Uh, he says, when my iPhone 6S joins the network, however, I get the following screen, uh, which he sent us a screenshot, showing that orange, no internet connection below the Wi-Fi network with the exclamation point in the Wi-Fi icon. So this is in the settings app on iOS. Uh, he says, uh, Google Foo has failed me, rebooting the router, updates on the phone and airport, changing the network name, hiding or unhiding, resetting network settings. None have worked. So when the iPhone connects and the Macs do this, too, the iPhone's a little more obsessive about it, if you will. Uh, when they connect, they don't just connect to the Wi-Fi. They also try to load a page that Apple.com hosts. And it's one of a variety of pages. Apple hosts several of these uh, to make sure that not only does it get an IP address from the router and appears to have a strong Wi-Fi connection, it also makes sure that it can get out to the Internet. And this is the thing that if you're in like a hotel or coffee shop, perhaps triggers that captive portal scenario or it's supposed to trigger the captive portal 
and show you the, you know, the, uh, the, hey, you're supposed to log in here, you know, welcome guest, that kind of thing. So generally it works fairly well. Um, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes non-standard or non-default settings in the network scenario uh, can cause this, especially DNS settings I have seen. So when you're there, tap on that little I next to, you know, the information I next to the network name that's that's failing and see what it's doing. See if there's anything in here that's not just default. Make sure configure DNS is set to automatic set uh, configure IP to automatic. It, you know, just take a look through these things. And it may be that you have to forget the network and tell it to reconnect fresh you know with a new password and not not a new password but you will be forced to re-enter the password so those are my thoughts on on that john what do you think i think i'd read this article that i found called if your iphone ipad or ipod touch won't connect to a wi-fi network i like it and they go through a lot of steps including the one that you mentioned which uh i've actually had to do that in the, especially when connecting to a uh, public wi-fi is uh, sometimes you got to click on the little I in order to uh, get some progress. Yep. Like a lot of times when I click on that, I'll get the web page asking me to log in or agree to their terms or something. Yeah, like of course. Yeah, the captive portal is what we call that. That's right. Yep. I, you know, speaking of captive portal, I mentioned I played a gig last night. We were, it was a this party function band that I play with, which involves you get to the, the place really, really early. And set up before all the guests arrive. Then then you sit around for hours while the guests arrive and do their schmoozing and whatever. And then at the end of the night after dinner, we appear and, and rock the house. Right. And all of that happened. But in those middle few hours, you know, you just kind of sitting around and, you know, camaraderie and we chit chat and stuff. But, uh, you know, it, it it you find ways to pass the time. And our, our guitar player had brought his tablet with him it was an Android tablet. And was trying to connect to the Wi-Fi. We were at a hotel function center and he could get connected. But any time he went to Google or Yahoo, which are the only sites he was trying, it was saying, do you have uh, an encryption error? Like someone is trying to hijack your Internet connection. And he's like, man, I can't get on the network. And I'm like, right, because Google and Yahoo always now do their connections as secure HTTPS connections. And so the first thing they do is negotiate that security certificate and then, uh, you know, and then and then pass data back and forth. But Google is saying, wait, or your browser rather is saying, wait, you visited Google dot com. But I have a security certificate that does not identify itself as being from Google dot com. We have a problem. Right. And that's what his browser was saying. And the problem is the captive portal at the hotel. So the trick is you need to connect to a website that does not use SSL so that when you are redirected to the captive portal, your browser doesn't freak out. And this happens on Macs, too. I, in fact, I see it all the time. There is a URL you want to memorize, and it's pretty easy because what you what you want to do is connect to a website that doesn't use SSL. So never SSL dot com will never they've promised Use a security certificate so you can visit never So we typed in never SSL onto his tablet and boom, it came up with the welcome to, you know, the hotel thing and click to agree to for, you know, 24 hours of Internet access or whatever it was. And boom, once he did that, then Google and Yahoo loaded totally fine. So never I don't think that's your problem here, uh, Phil, but it is one of those things that we all should uh, should memorize. It's a handy, handy thing. I use it. I, I almost use it by default when I join a hotel's network just to make sure that I'm not going to deal with, you know, everything. Because every other site I visit uses SSL. I mean, Mac Observer, Mac Geekab, like all those. We all we use SSL everywhere and we should accept these captive portals. It doesn't work because SSL is doing its job. Right. Good. Did you have you used never SSL like when we traveled to CES or whatever? Uh, didn't really have a, you never had really to. Need to. Yeah. Okay. Everything seemed to work. That's good. But I have had, yeah, what you mentioned, um, 
one of our local public Wi-Fi's, they were setting up a new uh, Cisco filtering system, and I would, yeah, I'd get you know security errors. Yep. It was like, yeah, the certificate doesn't match. I'm like, well, what? Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, this this would have uh, solved that. That's right. That's right. Yep. <laughs> Cool EO. All right. Um, let, while we're still on the uh, airport realm, old airport realm, let's talk to Dennis, who says, I have an old laser printer that I attach to an airport express so it can act as a wireless printer for everyone to use. Can I still use that airport express to extend it with the printer attached? My printer is far from the router so that I can't attach it directly he just recently the, the backstory is he just recently added a synology rt 2600 ac router um and he wants to know if he can still use his airport express and the answer is yes but to make your life easier uh and to keep your network from being uh messy you want to put that airport express in bridge mode essentially you want to turn off the router inside it and just have it be an equal citizen on your Wi-Fi network. If it has the router on, the way I think about it, and this is it's really hard to do uh, via audio to describe, but you know, I, I think about it as a hierarchy, right? So at the very top of the hierarchy is the the internet outside. Then between, then one step down from that is your cable modem or whatever. And then assuming it's a separate device, one step down from your cable modem now would be your router because it's the, the thing through which everything flows. Right. And then below that, below your router are all of your devices sort of flat and equal. And that's a good thing. You want everything flat and equal. But if in, for example, Dennis's scenario, you have uh, a device on that flat and equal that is a router, anything connected to that now will be another level down in the hierarchy, meaning those things can only sort of see through the airport express and are going to be on a separate IP range. And that can cause all kinds of weird problems. Uh, in fact, I was just dealing with a Mac Geek Cab listener slash Dave, the nerd client this week, uh, solving exactly this problem and putting the, the new device into bridge mode solves it because it, again, keeps everything on that flat and equal uh, level of the hierarchy so put it into bridge mode dennis and you should be totally fine what do you think mr braun does that synology does that offer a print server it does you, yes so the right you and that synology router has has a couple of things it's got usb ports so he could connect the printer directly to it he has a distance problem in this scenario where he wants the printer in a place yeah that's, I, right i saw that but um yeah, I just thought I'd mention it because um, mm -hmm. I tried that once to use my Synology as a as a network print server. It didn't quite work out at the time because the driver that it had for my printer wasn't quite right. Got it. Got it. Yeah, there was a slight mismatch. It was it was a uh, HP thirteen by nineteen uh, inkjet printer. Got it. Um, Got it. So things didn't come out quite right, but. Uh, yeah, no, that that's you're you're totally right. And, you know, the so the Synology and this would be true of the router or their disk stations. They both have this same technology in them. Um, so they have USB ports and you could plug a USB printer in and then share it amongst your network. In addition to that, your Synology is also capable of being what I'll call an air air print or and Google print proxy, meaning any printer. Either one that is connected, uh, you know, a USB one that's connected directly or any network printer. It can proxy for you and it can be that thing that allows you to take a non air print printer and turn it into an air print printer, which is great if you've got iOS devices. I use this all the time. So. Um, so there you go. You know, it's good. Thoughts on any of that, Mr. Braun? Yeah, I like AirPrint when um yeah yeah when I replaced or upgraded my uh my inkjet I got a Canon yep uh, and it has AirPrint which is great yeah it, it 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 having AirPrint is cool and and again if your printer doesn't support it there are ways to get yourself there and the Synology routers are one I think Uncle P in the chat room uh, suggests an app called Printopia and uh, we will of course put a link to that in the show notes but that will that will also allow you to 
uh, turn a non airprint printer into airprint. It'll it, it's, it, it's the proxy, you know, it just, it grabs the thing and does the thing. So, Hey, I want to, uh, I want to take a minute here and talk about our, uh, our first two sponsors. If that's okay with you, my friend. Awesome. All right. Our next sponsor is not only a new sponsor for MGG, but it's a sponsor who's doing something that's never been done before. And it's Experian with their new product, Experian Boost. Now, I know I don't talk about credit scores on the show here a lot, but it is something that is important to me and John, too. Right. We we spend some time talking about this. I've had low credit scores. I've had perfect credit scores. In fact, I think I have a perfect credit score right now. I'm a little competitive at times. You might have noticed over the years. And this is one of those things that you can, with a little bit of intention, you can get there. And now Experian with Experian Boost is going to help you, right? Because a good credit score not only gets you access to credit, but better interest rates, better for you, better for your family, all of that stuff. And for the first time ever, I, I can't believe it took someone this long to do this. For the first time ever, simply the act of Having paid and paying your utility and cell phone bills can instantly improve your credit score. So Experian's new product, Experian Boost, works by giving you credit for the bills you're already paying through your bank account, like water, gas, electric, cable, cell phone. It's game changing because it used to take months for anything you did to like nudge your credit score. And you'd always sort of wonder with Boost, it happens instantly and it's free. Right. Instant and free for something you're already doing. Like I said, I can't believe it's taken this long. Experian Boost can potentially help you establish or increase your access to credit, and you can boost your FICO score instantly for free. Boost is only available at Experian.com slash MGG. That's E-X-P-E-R-I-A-N dot com slash M-G-G. Go visit there now experian.com slash mgg our thanks to experian for doing this and also for being a sponsor our next sponsor is a sponsor you've heard about if you've been listening to mgg for a while and that is captera at you guessed it captera.com slash mgg c-a-p-t-e-r-r-a dot com slash mgg you use review sites to look for things like travel restaurants products services right in that process We've all read some surprising online reviews, right? Whether you're trying to get a sweet deal on something you've been saving for or trying to find the best happy hour in town, the best restaurant to go to, it's generally a good idea to read the reviews first. So why should finding the right software for your business be any different? You can read thousands. In fact, over 850,000 reviews of products from real software users at Capterra.com. They've got over 700 different categories of software, everything from project management to email marketing. to It's like everything, whatever you're doing in your business, your side hustle, whatever it is, Captera has a category for it. So you're not just looking at the one app. There's several apps and you can read the reviews. Remember from real users. This is important when you're running your business. It takes time to get set up with like a new piece of software. It's just how it goes. You don't want to spend that time only to find out, oh, this is wrong, not good. That's what Captera is for. Real users have already been through it. They can tell you. So you got to go check it out. Go to Captera.com slash MGG, C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash M-G-G. You can click the link in the show notes, the newsletter, whatever. Just go there and you'll be thankful. And we're thankful to Captera for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. An interesting question from Paul. It sort of dovetails into a conversation we were having last week or perhaps the week before. Um, Paul says, when, why, uh, I think either works, do you happily buy a first or one or two generation old item versus something new? And what are the reasons? Is price the factor? Is lack of major changes in the product a contributing factor? He says, for me, for example, my Bluetooth headphones got washed. He says, I found a two generation old set of Bluetooth headphones, the ones I had for under 20 bucks and knew they were 120. He says, so it was an easy choice for me and they still work great. Um, it, so this is an interesting conversation to have, right? For me, 
I, you know, I'll start this and say, I think price would be the biggest deciding factor, but there's always an asterisk, right? Especially, or perhaps only if there aren't enough major changes to warrant the latest and greatest, like when the MacBook air and Mac mini came out and I, I purchased those new in December because they weren't on the refurb store yet. And that's sort of the, the middle ground here is, is the refurb store, which I would say a hundred percent of the time buy refurb. If you can, if you, if you can afford to wait, I was in a scenario where waiting wasn't really the right thing. And we wanted to get our son a laptop for Christmas. He would have totally understood if we said, wait till January or maybe it was February, but you know, whatever. Uh, so, uh, you know, the latest and greatest had arrived with the air and the mini. They were the right things for what we needed. The air was great for me and my son. The mini was a perfect replacement for my wife's 11 year old iMac uh, at, at the house. And uh, so that took precedence over price at the time. Right. Um, with the iMac, though, that I want to get for the office, uh, it's kind of silly given Apple's current pricing to buy some. We talked about this last week. Like there's no reason to buy some four core machine from 2017 on refurb when you can get a six core machine with the 2019s. But I still want to save 15 percent because that's generally what you get with the refurbs. So I'm waiting for those to hit the refurb store because I'm not in a rush, right? I don't need an iMac right now. If I did, I would buy the new one. There's like that, those, the, those CPUs and the old ones, like there's just no reason to pay today's prices for, for, you know, two plus year old technology. Uh, but, you know, uh, but I can afford to wait. I'm, I'm not in a rush. My machines work. So when probably, you know, sometime I figure June might be the magic answer, uh, but we talked about that recently and, and then, you know, and then hopefully I'll, I'll be able to pull the trigger and, and pick something up. So that's, that's sort of my thought process. I don't know if that ex answers the question, John, wh what do you, what do you think? Every machine that I've, all of my recent machines have been refurbs. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have they, it. have they been. So I, I agree with you, right? As I said, refurb 100% of the time. But I think the the one layer deeper is, is it latest technology on refurb or is it, you know, a generation or two old also on refurb? Mm -hmm. Which? For you, um, are you are you buying latest tech on refurb? I, I know the answer to this, but I'm just like prompting for the for the sake of the show. For, we're always buying on refurb. So let's just take that as a given. Are you buying the latest technology or, uh, or, you know, a generation or two old and why? Um, probably a generation or two old, just the price of, uh, okay. no other reason. Yeah. Fair. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't need the latest, but you know, if, and when I, you know, upgrade, um, which, you know, like you, all of my machines are doing what I need. Right. I suppose they'll break someday, but or I'll break them. <laughs> yeah, right. One or the other. Yeah, fix it till it's broke. That's right. Uh, but um, yeah, and then I, you know, compare the latest to uh, what they got in the refurb store, and um, you know, just see if uh, see if it's worth paying a premium to get the absolute latest. You know, like you said, it's like, well, I could get a six core now versus a old four core. And it's like, well, you know, to me, it's like, well, maybe there's nothing wrong with getting the four core. But you could wait six weeks and get the six core on refurb. And, right, right. And now, like, it's it's a far less compelling delta, right, to 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 do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good question, though. Uh, but, I, you know, I so I think the takeaway here is. Always buy on refurb if you can, whether it's the latest tech or old tech, doesn't matter. You know, buy on refurb. You get the same one year warranty on computers. You can add Apple Care to it. And Apple actually has a thing where they talk about their refurbishment process. But essentially, your machine has now gone through the hands of an Apple technician. And that is not necessarily the case for your brand new machine that's being shipped direct to you from the factory. So. Uh, you know, I've had really good luck with refurb machines. Everybody has it, like, I've just not heard of any issues. So, um, yeah, so, yeah. they're better than new sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. I, I agree. Burned in, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, they're burned in. That's right. They do. They, they test them. All right. Scott has a, qu- a timely question for us. Hey, guys, this is Scott from Virginia. As I'm sure you'll cover on the show, Apple has announced that Aperture will no longer run on future operating systems after Mojave. This has me worried, as Aperture seems to be the only app that fits my workflow. I always felt Aperture had the best balance between having advanced features and not being overly complicated like other applications such as Lightroom. Aperture is also very flexible with the ways that you can store and organize photos, which syncs very easily to my iOS devices with iTunes. Another benefit of this setup is that there isn't any monthly fees to use the software or sync my photos. One feature that I've been unable to find from other solutions is the ability to create and sync smart albums between my Mac and iOS devices. I use smart albums and keywords on my photos to easily sort and find things. For example, I have a keyword of family that I apply on any pictures with my family, and then I have a smart album set up to show all pictures with that keyword. This means I can keep my photos sorted in different albums, for events like holidays or vacations, but with the Smart Album, I can view all of my family pictures in one place. Apple's Photo app appears to have this feature, however, there is no way to sync the Smart Albums to iOS devices. And outside of Apple's Photos app, there's no other software that I'm aware of that can easily sync with my iOS devices unless I pay for a cloud service like Adobe's Creative Cloud, which costs $240 per year. So I'm curious to know what you and the community uses for photo editing and management. I know Dave has talked in the past about storing his photos on disk station and using their apps to sync photos, but I don't see many capabilities for editing the photos, only sorting them. Ideally, I'd like something that can both edit and store and categorize my photos in one place, and then sync that amongst all of my devices. Does such a service exist for a reasonable price? I look forward to any feedback you or our listeners can provide. Thanks. Yeah, good question. So... You know, it's it's uh, I don't have the magic answer. I think we'll we'll perhaps treat this one as a geek challenge unless Mr. Braun has the magic answer. But I um, I I mean, I use photos. I don't my needs are not quite as specific as yours, Scott, although like if I had been doing that workflow, they, of course, would be. So I I grok the 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 necessity of it all. I'm not. I just don't know the magic answer. Um, I, I use photos. I also sync to Synology for moments, but you're right. There's no editing capabilities there. Moments is more of a backup for me than anything else. Although it's pretty cool. Like it does a pretty good job with it all. It's just not. Uh, it, it, and mo- sorry, moments is the Synology app that that and service, uh, you know, it's sort of the service that runs on your Synology and then the app that runs on your iOS devices to sync everything up and and all of that. And it works very, very well. And it has all the facial recognition and all that stuff. It's like hosting your own Google Photos. But editing isn't I haven't messed with a whole lot of that Um but you can do some tagging and things, but its goal is to be sort of the thing that auto tags and finds people and think like you could search for cars and it'll find all the photos that have cars in them and things like that. Right. I mean, just like photos and Google photos, except you're hosting it your own. So I, I think I think photos or Lightroom are your answers here, although it I, I know that especially for what you described, it's going to change your workflow uh, in a way that certainly we all don't like change so so there's that but it may not get you the capabilities that that you want what do you think john one thing i think is that there's an article here that may help you and it's called how to edit with third party apps and extensions in photos all right so one the answer is uh, or at least in my case is like you photos does enough for me but you can extend it the, i always forget about the this. reason that i yeah. abandoned Aperture is because, you know, people started saying, well, you know, we're not going to support plugins anymore because Apple's abandoning this. And it's like, oh, great. Yeah, right. But uh, Photos does support uh, extensions. Um, you know, as far as the organizational and all that, I, I think it's really your best choice. Yeah. You know, because it's baked into the Apple environment. Um, yes, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and you're right. Is- I, I always forget about the the extensions that you can use with photos. And in fact, if you go to system preferences extensions, 
And I'm trying to find this on my machine, but I'm realizing, is that just a, that's not just a Mojave thing. No, um, you go to system preferences, extensions, and then go to photo editing. You can choose which of your existing apps, including Apple's built-in markup, are made available to uh, to photos for photo editing. So that's a there's there you go. There's another tip. Yeah, they yeah. they kind of go through that on this article. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's similar it's one of those on the handy Mac. Things. That you, yeah. No, that is on the Mac. That's what I mean. On the Mac, you go to System Preferences, Extensions, and Photo Editing right there, and you might have some things you didn't even know that you could do. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, another thought is that you could, eh, it's not really a nice integrated solution. There may be, I mean, there may be edits that you want to make that are not really possible in photos. I mean, photos has pretty basic, you know, at least, uh, you know, enough for me. I, I rarely do edits anyways, you know, cause I always take perfect pictures <laughs> no, of course I just naturally the ones that suck. that's right yeah yeah that that's one way of editing is just delete the the bad ones yeah exactly yep um there is and actually you know i just checked this out i i haven't looked at this in a long while here but if you need more sophisticated editing um bring out the gimp right i guess i okay so have you used GIMP recently? GIMP is an open source photo editor. Have you used it well, on just, the Mac recently? I just, I just went to their page. They're up to uh, version 2.10.10 and it's Mac native. Okay. It's not, the, it's not the old X11 hack, but I I just fired huh. it up and it launched on my MacBook Pro here and it looks to have a whole bunch of tools. And hey, did you? It's, so you've launched it on your MacBook Pro? Oh, yeah. So I, now I have a question for you. Go to system preferences, extensions and photos. And tell me if there's a GIMP extension there for uh, photo editing. This would be because this I would be curious of. I, I'm not convinced photo GIMP is the editing. So go to um, yeah system preferences extensions. Yeah, it doesn't show up there. Yeah, I I'm going to I'm going to push back a little bit. I don't think GIMP is the right answer for most people, but I could be wrong. I have not used it in a long time well, for, for doing more sophisticated edits. Um, Again, it has, it has tools that um, are not in photos. It, sure. But so does Pixelmator. And so does yes. like like uh, what's the other one? Acorn. Right. I think Acorn is the name of it. I use Pixelmator and. Like for the price, I mean, it's less than 50 bucks, right? I think for Pixelmator mm -hmm. and it is so powerful and so easy to use. In fact, I would argue that if you aren't already totally entrenched in the workings of Photoshop and I grok that you might be in and that therefore makes Photoshop easy for you. But if you are not there uh, Pixelmator is way easier and for most people way more powerful than Photoshop because you can actually get stuff done. Um, it, 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 Pixelmator is fantastic. And and I've heard and I've experienced the same thing with with Acorn. Right. But um, but I, I just you know, I I started using Pixelmator and, and it became my thing and I can go to it and I can whip up images and do edits very, very quickly because now I'm used to it. But it's so easy to use. Um so, yeah, I, but I haven't tried GIMP in a while, I, but I'm not convinced that that's going to be the right thing for most people because GIMP was built to be a Photoshop clone. So I think it pretty much. Yeah, so I it's think it's, it might be too much. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, the it, tool that I needed at one point to use was uh, a lasso. I needed to, yeah, you know, grab an object out of something and, and it had the lasso tool just like Photoshop did. Sure. Yeah. I think it even had a smart lasso, but yeah, I haven't had to do edits like that in a while. The one thing I will mention here is that now you were asking, uh, you know, what's in the photo editing section here. The one pro one program that does show up in mine here is our pal Graphic Converter, which also lets you do some sort of edits. Yeah, I think in the a different to fame way. Is that it yeah. can read or output a huge variety of uh, formats. Right. And I, I'm going to thank Brian Monroe in our chat room here. Affinity Photo. That's the one I have not tested. It comes up every time we talk about this. And I'm glad, Brian, that you saved us from getting a pile of emails about this. 
that that's the other one that really is a strong contender in the kind of Pixelmator Acorn scenario. Uh, they've got apps for both iOS and Mac OS. Uh, it's 50 bucks. And I've again, heard great things. I gotta, I gotta test out affinity photo. I, that, that may be the, uh, that may be the next one on the, on the list. So very, very cool. Yeah, good. I'll have to check out GIMP and just see. But if it's a if it's a Photoshop clone, my guess is it's the wrong thing for for anyone that's not already a Photoshop user. But if you are a Photoshop user, GIMP might be a great either no cost or, you know, low cost alternative. So good, good. More on this, John, or uh, are we ready to move on to Jim? Uh, let's go to Jim. All right. Sweet. So uh, this is uh, Jim's. This this falls into my realm of five new things I've learned this week. Uh, listener Jim asked a very simple question. He said, I'll find it here. My daughter's going to Italy for a study abroad program. Uh, she has an iPhone XS and we have AT&T as our provider here in the USA. AT&T offers an international plan for 60 bucks a month for one gig or 120 bucks, bucks a month for three gigs covering most of Europe. She typically uses about three gigs of data per month at home. So I'm thinking of getting the three gig plan for 120. Is there a better way for her to get service in Italy since the 10S has dual SIMs? Should that be considered? We would prefer having her keep and use her current phone number, but it just depends on what else is out there. Yeah. So a couple of things just as set up here uh, in order for her to keep her phone number, she needs to keep her AT&T SIM in the phone like that. That's for sure. And, you know, when we went to Europe a few years ago, of course, dual SIM iPhones didn't exist. And we chose not to pay what at the time would have been AT&T's massively exorbitant rates. Um, I think it would have, it would have, you know, added five or six hundred bucks to the cost of our vacation for four phones to, you know, enhance the AT&T service for international. So we just got SIMs from a company called Three in London at the, the I think cost us 20 bucks for each of them and got unlimited data for a month, which was more than we needed throughout Europe, which worked. Um, and that may still be your best option here is something like that. But now that iPhones and specifically hers, the 10 S have dual SIMs, she can do this without having to turn off her AT&T number for two weeks. I mean, it doesn't turn it off. It just means that any calls into it or texts into it won't arrive on her phone until she puts that SIM back in. But with dual SIMs, she doesn't have to take it out um, on that phone. Unless you get the Chinese version, which I'm pretty sure you didn't. It's not true dual SIM. It's one SIM tray and one e SIM. So you have to pick a provider that supports e SIM. Uh, that's a virtual SIM that doesn't require a physical addition to the phone. This can actually be a very handy thing. Because what we had to do is get off the plane in London and, you know, get all our crap and go through customs and, you know, immigration and all that stuff. And then we had to go to a three store in Heathrow. And, you know, it, it was like mayhem in there. Try because everybody does this and tries to get a SIM and you have to buy it and activate it and all that stuff. Uh, you can avoid that because you can use eSIM. Apple has an article uh, that talks about what carriers support eSIM and uh, they don't list anything specific for Italy. But don't fear. Um, there are options because there are global options, but also there are some, you know, European sort of general options. The first two that I will mention, and and as I was going through this, I realized Everyone with a dual SIM capable iPhone. So it's the 10S, 10S Max, 10R. I think those are the, the only three. Correct me, please, if I'm wrong on that. Um, anyone with a dual SIM iPhone should get all of the apps that I'm about to mention and have them on your phone ready to go. Uh, the first two are GigSky and TruePhone. These are companies that offer eSIM support basically worldwide. And the cool part is you can get to a country and say, OK, I'm in Italy. What are my options? And uh, and, you know, with with Gig Sky, it was like, OK, uh, we have Italy and other countries. So they have a European plan and I can get a 15 day plan 
for a one gig for 20 bucks, two gigs for 30 bucks, or a 30 day plan that gives me five gigs for 50. And that's throughout Europe. Okay, great. Then I ran the True Phone app, and they have an option specifically for Italy. And so three gigs was only $19. So, you know, that's quite a savings over even what the gig sky was going to offer. And, uh, and, you know, and then you're, and that's for 30 days. So you have these options and obviously this is, you know, from when I checked earlier this week, these things will evolve and change over time, but you can, you can just look and I could have bought right there on the moment. Like you do it, you, you pay for it. And now boom, your phone is activated with your eSIM and you now have two numbers on your phone. You have the one that you just got from GigSky or TruePhone and then also your AT&T number. And and then uh, iMore has a great article that sort of shows you all the options. You would then go into the, the settings for cellular for your phone once you've enabled this, this eSIM service and you can pick which one is the default for outgoing calls. In fact, you can even pick per contact which SIM is going to call outbound. You can pick which SIM is the default for your data so that you're not using your AT&T data expensively in Italy. You know, you have all these great options and, and I more put together a great little article about, um, about how to do this. So those are, those are sort of the, the world options. Um, and then there are a couple of options, U S carriers, uh, now, some U.S. carriers now support eSIM, T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T. The first two allow you to do it in an app. As far as I understand with AT&T, you have to go into the store to do this. Um, probably not going to be the right one price-wise for what you're talking about. Verizon and T-Mobile are not built to sell you these sort of one-off plans at a price that competes with gig sky or true especially just for data. But, um, but you, you know, it, it might be the right thing, right? Um, so it's worth checking out, but it is worth having all four of those apps. So it's gig sky, true phone. We'll put links to these. Uh, T-Mobile has a separate app called T-Mobile eSIM. And then Verizon just uses their, my Verizon app to do, uh, to do this. So, and then, like I said, at t you got to go to the store, but lots of options. And, you know, in the chat room pre-show, we were kind of going through some of this stuff and, and making sure we had our ducks in a row. Uh, and uh, someone pointed out, Dave Ginsburg in the chat room pointed out that he used T-Mobile's eSIM app here in the U.S. and moved his phone to T-Mobile. And that's it. Like he's only using the eSIM from T-Mobile, not just as a secondary backup, whatever it is, his, his app. And and T-Mobile, if you can get good T-Mobile service at your house and where you normally are, T-Mobile is a plan. It is a service very much worth considering. You'll pay quite a bit less than you would for like Verizon or AT&T. And their international stuff is just automatically included with their, I think they call it the T-Mobile one plan. So anyway, uh, it's very interesting and worth thinking about. And like I said, at the very least, worth getting those apps and putting them on your phone so that you have them in the moment when you need it, because in order to download the app, you got to have data service. And so now you're in a catch 22. You can also sign up with eSIM using a QR code. So you, in theory could do like buy it Heathrow and, and like scan or, or whatever part you're going to, you know? So it's crazy, but it's flexible and that's the key because it's, yeah, I like the idea of not having to procure a SIM, especially if the plane lands at you know two in the morning and the SIM store is closed or you know whatever. You just want to get to your hotel and yada yada yada. So exciting! What do you think, John? Oh, good to know. Yeah, it is good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. I'd probably go with whatever Verizon offers because I have the iPhone eight and it only supports one SIM. So my advice to you would be: don't do that. You'll, I mean, depending on how long you would be in, in Europe, I think, I think Verizon will charge you like 10 bucks a day, which yeah. exactly you, which is why I recommend just take your SIM out, put a European SIM while you're there and just use that, um, mm. you know, and you could use a, I think, I know you can do it in an iPad. You could use a, like a gig sky SIM, which is sort of a, a universal SIM, but I think that's only data. I don't think gig sky is offering 
phone service. So that might not be enough for you, but it might like depending on what you're using while you travel. But, um, but yeah, no, I would just get a, for, for people that don't have dual SIM phones, I would, I, you, you can't easily, if you're, if you're willing to like jump through some hoops, maybe, but you can't easily buy like a European SIM from the U S because, you know, you have to be local to that area in order to buy phone service there. It's just how all these regulations work, but you know, you just, I would, for like for you, I would say, get off the plane, go to you know, the T-Mobile or the, like the three store or what, any one of those stores and just buy a SIM and put it in your phone and, and use that in Europe. Um, it was way cheaper, like way, way cheaper. So, and it's really not that big of a deal. It's just sort of the mayhem of the store. I will offer one piece of advice. If you're going to do that ahead of time, decide where you are going to keep your Verizon SIM or your at and whatever SIM you're taking out of your phone, decide where in your travel bag you're going to keep that. Get like a baggie or something. And as soon as you take it out of your phone, put it there. I recommend doing this on the plane so that you don't accidentally use your data service, you know, from the U.S. abroad. Uh, put it there and leave it there and don't lose it because you will want it again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I did a search and yeah, it comes up with uh, what you said, 10 bucks, 10 bucks a day per line. Yeah, per line. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For one person traveling, that's not terrible. For four people, like it was instantly, okay, 40 mm. bucks a day. Oh, no, 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 no. For two days worth of, of, uh, of service on AT&T or Verizon, I got, you know, a month's worth with all the data I wanted, so... Yeah, Mac Vader in the chat room is saying he's he's lost a sim during travel. You are not alone. We yeah, we thought thankfully thought about that ahead of time. It was like, oh, we need to be very careful. And even putting them back in in the plane, uh, you know, on the way home, it was like, all right, if we hit turbulence while we're messing with these tiny little sims and they fall on the floor of an airplane, nope, they're gone. <laughs> so Uncle P says that Pelican makes a uh, sim case. So if you're doing this a lot, uh, that's perhaps worth it. But we just put them in baggies that, you know, like plastic bag, um, one bag per person with a label in the bag as to whose phone uh, that SIM was to go back into. Because otherwise, as you might guess, uh, you will get it wrong. So. All right. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I want to talk about our next two sponsors, if that's okay, Mr. Braun. Sure. Surely. Uh, our first one, surely, is Text Expander. Uh, Text Expander 6.5. Man, like, this is one of those tools that I truly can't live without. Uh, Text Expander, for those of you that don't know, allows you to take big blocks of text or small blocks, doesn't matter, that you routinely use over and over again. So it could be simply your email address or your phone number, and you don't want to get it wrong, or your mailing address, and you don't want to get it wrong. You don't want to fat finger anything in, in any of those uh, when you're sending them to people. But it could also be if you have like a customer service type response. You know, if, if you find yourself here, if you find yourself either using a sticky or Going through when you have to send an email to someone and going back through your sent folder to find the similar email that you sent to a different someone and copying and pasting that to put it into the email and then tweaking it for that particular person, Text Expander would save you time and make sure you are accurate because that's how Text Expander works. You take those snippets instead of leaving them in your outbox or stickies or whatever, you put them into Text Expander. And then you get to just invoke them either by a click of a mouse or by typing a short bit of text, hence expander, right? You type a short bit, it expands into a long bit and you know that it's accurate. You know that it's perfect because you've already built the snippet. And the cool thing with text expander is you don't just have to have, you know, sort of static snippets. You can have things in them like insert the current date, insert the name of the person to whom I'm replying, insert the contents of the clipboard, all sorts of those things. And now with Text Expander 6.5 for macOS and version 2.0 for Windows, 
it sports a new visual editor for snippets. So you don't have to remember like short codes and things like that to put in there. You can see it visual fill-ins, dates, date math, nested snippets, and more. And you can insert them all like words, phrases, forms, templates with just a couple of clicks, right? This is where text expander totally rocks. So you got to check it out. Go to textexpander.com slash podcast uh, to learn more and download Text Expander and get 20% off your first year. You'll choose Mac Geek Eb from the list when you visit textexpander.com slash podcast, of course. Uh, and then you get 20% off your first year. So our thanks to Text Expander for doing what they do and for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is Malware Bytes for the Mac. Man, this is another one of those apps that I'm so glad I have. I was messing around with my MacBook Air the other day and was like, oh, man, I got to make sure it was being slow or whatever. And, uh, you know, I ran Onyx on it and did other things. I was like, wait a minute, I need to run malware bytes on it. And so I did. And, you know, the best part is it scanned my entire Mac and it took 29 seconds. They say it scans the average Mac in under 30 seconds. It took 29 seconds. I can't scan my Mac for anything. In that short period of time, it looked at the whole thing, 29 seconds. It thankfully didn't find anything, but if it did, it would have found and removed adware, uh, viruses, ransomware, and any other malware right there. And you can even have it do that in real time with their advanced anti-malware technology so that it catches all your dangerous threats automatically. So you're protected without even having to think about it. And your Mac keeps running silky smooth. I, I have malware bytes on every Mac. I, I know John you use it too. And it's fantastic. It truly is one of those things that everybody should have. Because it's when, not if, someday this will happen to all of us. We will wind up downloading the wrong thing and boom, we've got it. Malwarebytes protects us. And here's the deal. Go to Malwarebytes.com slash Mac. You can download Malwarebytes for free and you can use it for free. But you also get a 14 day trial of their premium offering, which includes that real time scanning in the background all the time. So you get to check that out too. check it out. Malwarebytes.com slash Mac and our thanks to Malwarebytes for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, you use Malwarebytes, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Go ahead. No, I, uh, the, it actually came in handy because the, because the uh, last time it, uh, I was at my parents, um, it found something. Really? Yeah. yeah. No, when I I looked and there was actually a dialogue up saying, hey, yeah, uh, this download is uh, is bad. I'm going to get rid of it for you. Wow. And, so, and it did get rid of it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, awesome. It, it intercepted it. and uh, oh, That's great, man. Yeah. <clears throat> so check it out. Malwarebytes.com slash Mac. It's a, it's a good thing. Everybody, we all need it. All right. Uh, we have kind of a geek challenge, I think. Another, another one here. And uh, this one comes from Barbara, who asks, she says, um, I'm videoing my granddaughter's high school softball games. They're usually about an hour and a half. Uh, what I want to do is go through the whole game and delete the parts that we don't want, keeping the moments that we want to keep. She wants to essentially create a highlight reel of the game. Uh, she says, I've tried with iMovie to help uh, and, and, and also have taken some Apple classes at my Apple store about iMovie. But it seems like the wrong tool for this. She says, uh, I wonder if you know what the right tool is to do something like this. I, I don't. Um, I because I don't do enough of this, but I I like I like this path. If I were in the, in your shoes, Barbara, and I had to do this right now, knowing what I know, I would most likely use uh, ScreenFlow. It's not and it, like it's not advertised as doing this right. It's built to record your, uh, you know, the screen videos and, and things like that. Like we use it for tutorials and how to's and things like that. It can also film the camera, but you can also import a clip into it. So I would import the clip that that you took 
And then it's got a really easy timeline editor where you can just go through and chop things out and and uh, and make life really easy, starting just from the one clip. You don't have to keep bringing clips in. It it just sort of does it. So I would use ScreenFlow because, you know, it's familiar to me and, and I know that it has this timeline editor so I could get it done. But I bet there's something better. Um, Uncle P in the in the chat room is suggesting both clips and QuickTime Pro. Um so and and Brian Monroe notes correctly that ScreenFlow is 129 bucks, so not inexpensive. I again, it's you know, it's I already have it, but but that's a very good point that that's quite a bit of money to spend uh, just to do this. And again, there's probably something more purpose built. So we'd love to hear about it. You know, we mentioned uh, the, the feedback at MacGeekGab.com, but you can also call us two two four eight 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 Geek. I believe is the right phone number. John, what's Geek? Four three three five. Thank you, thank you. Or post in our uh, in our forums at macgeekup.com slash forums. We'd love to uh, we'd love to hear about it. So yeah. Do you have any thoughts on this one, John? Yeah, video editing. Hmm. Yeah. I found a nice little summary here from uh, iMore. Okay. So Adobe Premiere, Adobe Premiere Elements. Yep. Apple Final Cut Pro. Yeah. Like these all seem a little bit overkillish to me. Oh yeah, no, those are yeah, that those, those are more pro editing tools. Yeah, and they also list iMovie saying, "Hey, it's Apple's freebie." Yep. And as mentioned, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I mean, even QuickTime Pro can do it for you. You just you know put a marker does at one pro, point and then the other, and then you you delete the stuff you don't want. Don't does know. QuickTime Pro exist? Like, is that a going concern though? I don't or the QuickTime editor. I'm Just sorry. the QuickTime player. Okay, all right. So we don't call it QuickTime yeah, Pro. Pro is um it was an old gosh. thing. Yeah. Like well actually I did activate it on um I still have the old uh I think like QuickTime 7 player. It still runs. It it, it still gets selected as the player for yep. some videos that I have. But I actually had my uh Pro key <laughs> and enabled it. I saved it somewhere. <laughs> That's too funny. That's too funny. Yeah, so yeah, it would be it would just be QuickTime. Okay. Well, that I mean, and that's fine. There's that's that's good. Yeah, Uncle P says he's using it on Mojave too. So, all right, uh, let's see. Where are we here? We have so much to go through here. Let's um, you know, we've got some tips uh, and really some follow ups from recent episodes, and I I think we should probably take the a moment and and go through these here so that we don't uh, so we don't forget. So. Let's see how quickly, how many of these we can get through and how quickly we can do it. Listener Tim is actually Tim from Sectigo, which formerly was Komodo. And we talked about their certificates um, over the years. And he pointed out that these certificates in their eyes and, and, and he also acknowledges that that certainly in the past they didn't do anything to uh, to make this apparent. But now they are. That those free certificates for SMIME for email are built to be uh, trial certificates so that you can test out the service and uh, and and then, you know, move into it. And with a 30 day cert now, that is exactly what those become. He also pointed out, I said, you know, I was looking for an inexpensive option for uh, for a certificate. And he pointed out, he says, you know, it is nineteen ninety nine a year or you can do three years for forty nine ninety nine. So you save 10 bucks on that. So, yeah, you know, like if you want to continue to use S-MIME, there you go. Um, I, you know, um, I'm not sure if I will continue to use S-MIME after this. I think I might just stick with open PGP because that's arguably even more secure. It's just not native to iOS. Although S-MIME certainly doesn't feel native to iOS either, mm -hmm. even though officially it is. So there's nobody else that offers a free certificate. No. And I think that that's. That's a that's an indicator that this is not a um, not a viable path. Right. I mean, usually, you know, like like if you've got hey, we were talking about Dropbox and how they're changing their free tier or whatever. And then that but there's, you know, like there's other services, there's box and there's, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no one else and hasn't been anyone else for a very long time that offers free certs, free S-MIME certs. So I think that that's a good indicator that maybe this is not 
something that's viable. Although I'm hoping that Let's Encrypt will do it, right? Because Let's Encrypt does free SSL certificates for your uh, I website. I read my mind. I, I think I looked to see if they offer uh, SMIME, and they, they currently don't. They don't, but they SSL. would be the, yeah, they would be the people that I think could do it. But again, it's I I I don't know that the market is is big is worth is big enough to be worth doing this, right? Like it it, it I, yeah, I'm not sure SMIME is the right path to go. So. KiwiGram points out that Let's Encrypt's free SSL certificates last three months, and he's right. But because those certificates are running on a web server, you can very easily set up an engine that will just auto renew them every 60 days. And so you never run out. In fact, I am 99 percent certain that MacGeekGab.com uh, uses uh, an, uh, a, a, Let's en- a Let's Encrypt cert. Uh, for those of you that are on the stream, you might be able to see it there. But anyway, I'm pretty sure we're using a Let's Encrypt cert for, for Mac Geek Um So anyway, there you go. Lis- listener John points out something very interesting. But we do use Let's Encrypt certs for lots of things, even if I'm, I'm 99% certain we're using it for Mac Geek Yeah, Yeah, um, but you're right, Kiwi, that not doing that in mail or doing that in mail every three months is also not unless there's some automated way to just have those regenerated. Um, and I don't know that there would be the problem with mail certs. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but problem with mail certs, like a, an SSL certificate for a website is used for the session and only the session. There's no benefit to using the same certificate tomorrow. When you visit the website, you're just going to renegotiate the connection and it's fine. It's real time. It's synchronous. Email certificates are asynchronous, meaning I send you my certificate. Yes, I can sign my message with it, and that's handy. But in order for you to encrypt a message to me, you need to use the certificate I've already sent you. So asynchronously, I send it to you. Then in a future date, you encrypt a message with that certificate back to me. If the certs are expiring every 30 days or even every 90 days, that makes that process a little weird because if I send you assert and you wait two weeks to send me an email and my certificate has expired you now cannot send me an email with it so yeah really it would it would need to have a longer expiration so anyway listener john points out something very interesting about um resetting the t2 chip which he had to do on his first uh gen macbook pro uh trying to install the Mojave beta screwed up his T2 chip and he needed to reset it. And there is an Apple article. Uh, actually it's a section in the user guide about this. And it, it's weird. Uh, he points out that the instructions say to hold down, uh, the, the power touch ID, the touch ID button is a power button, right? You can float your thumb on it or finger on it to do, you know, touch ID, but you can also push it and it's a power button. And then, uh, hold down right shift left option and left control. And the issue is that it requires you to do those things in an, in a specific order, but it's not clear about it because what it says is, and I'm trying to find this on the, on the web page. Um, it says while holding down the power button at the same time, uh, press all three of the following keys, right shift, left option, left control. When you know that you need to hold down the power button first, that sentence makes sense. But if you don't know that, you might think that you hit all four at the same time. The problem is that any key other than the power button will start up your Mac just by pressing it. So, and we'll bypass this scenario and you need to have power plugged into the right port. It needs to be on the left side, front most port, like the port closest to the keyboard. Um, so you have power plugged in and then you, and then you do this. So you, but, and then you hold down the power button. Don't release it because that would then start it up. But if you hit any other key, that will also start it up. So you hold down the power button and then right shift, left option, left control, and that will reset the T2. So just bear this in mind that there is an order to these things. If you ever find yourself there and thank you listener, John for, uh, 
for hipping us to that because handy, handy stuff. All right. Uh, moving on to Todd uh, here. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. I had a link for everyone. And so I will put that in there and then we'll clean up the show notes later. Maybe one of you can clean up the show notes for us because not only will the show notes be at MacGeekab.com, but the show notes will also be in the email that you get when you sign up at MacGeekab.com. All right. Uh, now, listener Todd says, um, I'm not sure why. But Mac OS only gives you a head up when your Magic Mouse 2 battery is at 5%, which means you will soon have to stop your workday to give it a charge. He says, I started searching around for another solution and found a number of terminal solutions and apps, but the winner was what I was already running, iStat Menus. The new iStat Menus, the current iStat Menus, I should say, has notifications built in and you can customize these. And one of those things you can customize is setting up a notification for the battery life on any of your devices that report battery life back to your Mac. And of course, your Magic Mount mouse can be one of those. So thank you very kindly, Todd. That's a great little tip. Do you use that for uh, notifications, John? Battery notifications, rather? Mm, no, I use fruit juice gives me notifications. On your, on your, oh, you don't have like a, you don't have a wireless mouse or a wireless keyboard that reports to Mac OS. Like you don't have a track, a magic no. trackpad or anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Fruit juice would not tell you about those batteries. It would only tell you about your Mac's internal no, battery. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I get notifications as to my yeah. Mac battery level. Yeah, right. You're, you're right, right. I'm, I'm not really using any, uh, any battery powered wireless devices. Right, right, right. All right. Speaking of notifications, Bill has a tip. He says there's a new setting in notifications, mail favorite mailboxes that enables notifications on favorited folders as well as the inbox. He says, I noticed this when my folder notifications started appearing on my phone and not iPad. Uh, he says, I don't think this setting was here in the past. Um, and, and he's right. It, it wasn't, it's, I think it's, it might've been iOS 11, but, but certainly iOS 12. So yeah, on iOS, go to notifications, mail favorite, and then you can set favorite mailboxes so that, uh, your favorited mailboxes now see now you now get notifications for things that are filtered into those as well. So yeah, very handy to have that granularly controllable, it used to happen sometimes to people. I think Bill was one of them several years ago that was reporting this and there was no way to tweak it. So, yes. Yes, yes. Um, we talked last week, last week, two weeks ago about one password. And, uh, you know, we we're talking about divesting ourselves from Dropbox because of the new changes and that I was going to move one password syncing to iCloud because I assumed that would mean that it could sync in the background without the app running. Turns out, no, it does not. But if you sync with 1Password's 1Password.com service, it does sync in the background. And I have confirmed this. And John, you also confirmed this with LastPass. Um, if you're in LastPass, you are always using their service with 1Password. That's sort of the default now. But for those of us that have been using it a long time, it's not necessarily the, the default uh, it does sync in the background. You don't have to launch the app to keep everything up to date, which makes life way easier uh, if you're you know, using the Safari integration and all that stuff. So using a one password dot com account, you get multiple vaults. I, I, I have had a one password dot com account for about a year and I hadn't been using it. But I after we talked about it last week, I started using it. It's fantastic. I added my family to it. I, I have a family account now. Uh, we have shared vaults, uh, which is, I, I know this isn't new, but it's new to me. And if you haven't done this, it's awesome. Uh, we have some things in our shared, shared vaults that everybody gets to see. Um, I have one credit card that I actually share with the kids. They have their own, um, you know, their, their own cards to use, but it's the same number and everything. So I, we have that in the shared vault. We have like our driver's licenses and our passports so that if anybody's like booking travel or whatever and needs that information, it's all right there. My wife does, uh, Elisa does a lot of work with us at the 
you know, the businesses. So there are many logins that we needed to share, like bank logins where the password changes every three months or something. And we would always screw it up because one of us would change the password and then have to tell the other. Nope. Now we just put it into one password and it's automatically synced. It just, like no thought needs to go into the process whatsoever. It's automatic. Um, so I'm really still actually stoked about this. I will also say this, though. I had no idea that I was running one password six on two of my three Macs that I use regularly. I never got if I got a warning, it stopped. I have it checking for updates. It doesn't tell me if you are running one password, make sure that you are running one password seven. Um, because there's some things, especially with touch ID on my laptop that are just way better with uh with one password seven go so go check that out just be aware so and last pass and you did confirm that right john for us that that uh, last pass does background updates without having to launch the app too that's what they say and did but i thought you said well, you i found a it. support uh, i found a support article that said okay this is what should happen but if it doesn't here's how you can force it got it so. yeah right and i think that's also true of one password like it 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 most of the time it will happen but but i'm sure there's some scenario where ios won't let it yeah exactly exactly all right um in 758 we talked about wiring your house and when the walls are open wire everywhere well we have two additions to this uh listener glenn it says another suggestion is to put a few land drops in ceiling boxes in central locations that could allow for access points in the ceiling for Wi-Fi uh, for coverage over a large area. He says, I typically run single runs to locations that need more connections like a TV with a satellite receiver, Apple TV, uh, and then use a switch there. That that makes sense. But, yeah, the ceiling, there are many things and you can. You know, if you're using something like like I am currently I'm using Ubiquity's uh, Unify setup, those are all powered with power over Ethernet. So you can, you know, run power to these things. It's like, yeah, drops in the ceiling. That's a good if the if the ceilings open, run them. You, you will not be disappointed down the road. So that's a good suggestion, Glenn. And then uh, listener Rob, along the very same lines, says, uh Oh, he's we uh, in 2005, we had a custom home built and took a week's va He says, I took a week's vacation to string cat five and coax all over the house before the sheetrock went up. When the electrical inspection was performed, the inspector said he hadn't seen that much cable in most commercial buildings. He says, I bring this up because I thought I really covered it all, including the garage and thinking ahead to even IP based cameras using power over Ethernet in strategic locations. Oh, right. Ceiling could be used for that, too. He says, however, I missed one. And I think it is a rather important one. I couldn't have foreseen the emergence of doorbell cameras at the time, but I am now aware that companies like Ring make a POE version of their cameras for more elegant installations, POE being power over Ethernet. I only bring this up to encourage you to mention it on the show or at least pass that along to anyone asking. Yeah, that's great advice, man. Yep. The doorbell anywhere and everywhere. It's good. It's good. All right. Can we make it through more of these tips here? Um, I'm not sure how many we can get through. I, I will. We'll do Chris's because password managers came up and, and that's a good one. Uh, Chris says, uh, I loved your tip about the Apple TV uh, and being able to use the remote app on the phone to type in passwords instead of having to navigate around. He says, my kids know already that if a password page pops up on the Apple TV, they just call dad to fix it on his phone. But it's even better than you mentioned in the podcast, because not only can you type on your iPhone keypad, keypad through the remote app, if your password manager uh, is installed on your phone, that's integrated as well. He says, for me, it's one password uh, and he also notes the family plan is a lifesaver, uh, but it would work for, you know, uh, iCloud keychain and LastPass also integrates like it's all right there. And he says, if you have the autofill password setting from uh, from that enabled, the password will autofill when clicking on the toolbar over the keyboard. Voila, a 16 character random password entered instantly on the TV screen and the kids are watching their next show with no muss, no fuss. So that's a good one, Chris. Thank you for that. I like it. I like it. Uh, 
Anything is left on the agenda that, that jumps out at you, John, for us to do before we say goodbye to uh, everyone for this week? Hello, Mr. Braun. Yeah, just just looking. Just this. looking. Okay. I will. Um, I will share Bob's. Um, we, we will end with with Bob's, and uh, and you know that's how it goes. He says uh, he points out. In fact, that, you know, we were talking about startup chimes on the Mac in episode 757. And uh, Bob notes that the startup chime died uh, at the age of 32. At the age of 32, he has uh, he has an article at his Working Smarter for Mac Users uh, website. This is Dr. Mac. And, uh, yep, startup chime died after 32 nice long years. But that's the end of that. And I think he says uh, he posted this in 2016 and said the MacBook Pros that were introduced in, in the fall of 2016 uh, did not have the startup chime. So there you go. And, and speaking of chimes and sound and music, John, I think it's time to bring the band in out of the uh, lovely spring weather that I know is outside. Yes, yes, yes. Anything to add to that, Mr. Braun? No, no. Yeah, it's bad about the chime. Is it? I bet you there's a hack. I don't know that there is. I think that's a firmware thing, man. Oh, they may have just right. I mean, it, it. like there's no Mac OS running when the startup chime happens. So, yeah, not convinced. But alas, that's how things go. You know. Uh, so we. I already told you how to email us. We told you how to contact us. But please do go sign up at MacGeekCab.com for the email newsletter. We would love to have you there. We would love to have you push us into the realm where we have to pay for a MailChimp account. So that is on you. Sign up and fill it up. It would be awesome. We would love to have it. And thank you again to all of you that went to MacGeekCab.com slash iTunes and either updated or added reviews so many of them coming in. Let's keep it up, folks. Let's let's keep going as long as we can with uh, with new reviews. It's it's really awesome, and it it you know helps us percolate there, which is good for a show that's 14 years old. Uh, it's hard to percolate, and uh, we almost 15. Is that right? Are we in our 14th year. Is that what it is? I forget. That's coming up next month, man. Yeah, I thought I saw it on, on my calendar. Yeah, it's uh, June 13th is the day. And uh, so this will be this will be our 14th anniversary. All right. We are in our 14th year. Right. Because we started in 2005. So, uh, yeah, no, just go to MacGeekGab.com. Alex is asking in the chat room how to um, how to sign up. Just go to MacGeekGab.com. There's a there's a form right there on the website. You just good to go. Sign up right there. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I want to thank Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. And of course, thanking all our sponsors, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, Experian.com slash MGG, Capterra.com slash MGG, TextExpander.com slash podcast, malwarebytes.com slash Mac. Of course, other world computing at barebones. Other other world computing at MacSales.com, barebones software at barebones.com. Eero at Eero.com slash MGG. Good stuff, folks. It's all good. John, what do you have to say? Anything? I got Any? nothing. You no, got nothing. wait, I got something. You know Are what you that sure? something is, Dave? What is that something? Don't get caught. Made up.